Hello, folks. Welcome to a massive installment of the 31 Days of Howling Beasts. Uh, I am behind once again because my October has been crazy with mediocrity. But seriously, folks, we're here to talk about film. 31 of them all together for the whole total of October. Got some great guys on this on this episode. Uh, myself being uh, included in that sadness. Uh, I know. I know I'm terrible. But um, we'll hear some other great reviews on here. That I'm sure you you may uh, or may not enjoy. I hope you enjoy everything. Um, like I said, happy Halloween season to y'all. It's getting colder here in Chicago land. I couldn't be fucking happier. By the weekend, it'll be 40 degrees at night nighttime. It's gonna be wow. I can't can't wait. But uh, warm up that cider. We're gonna talk about some beast films now. And uh, f- first of all, you know, I, I I said I would do this on my next recording. You know, the the, the moment you guys have not been waiting for. My assessment on the film that seems to have divided a whole community, whether you like it or, you know, you don't like it, whatever you choose, there is no judgment here. That film is the the, the middle film to your brand new Halloween trilogy. Halloween Kills, um, watch it on Peacock. I didn't go to the theater because I, I don't drive. That, that's the thing with me in the theaters, so I'm kind of glad it was, it was where it was, but I paid for Peacock. So I watched it on there, watched it at work, because I wanted to watch it right away to, you know, wait for, you know, the fanboys to either be butthurt or listen to whatever they had to say and say, hey, I saw it. Now here's here's my tiny assessment about what you guys don't care about, my tiny assessment. And uh, <laughs> in case you didn't see uh, the last Halloween film, it starts off pretty much right after that one ends, you know, last time on Halloween. Michael is burning inside of Lori's house, trapped in a basement, and that's where it starts. And then it gets to the controversial part to where, you know, hey, firefighters are mad about this sort of thing, and you know, what what would happen if emergency, you know, services came to a house that was burned down that had a psychopath in it? They actually let him out, and he murders everybody in sight because he has no motive now. Halloween 2 does not exist in any series anymore. Most inconsistent character in a horror franchise ever for that reason i this is why i love and hate the series but anyway he's out he's killing people no motivation whatsoever if i drop some spoilers here i apologize ahead of time i assume most of those who listen or who who give a shit uh have seen it already um i won't be too spoilery here though i promise that he's out he's loose he's killing some people including uh You've heard this from from uh, Jason Blum himself on the fucking um, Joe Bob thing that uh, he kills uh, comedy legend Lenny Clark shows up in this movie and I'm so happy and then all of a sudden he's fucking dead, you know. But there will be a part in that scene that will make a wrestling fan like myself scream "Hardcore match!" and then it happens and then you'll you, 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 you'll know when it happens if you're a wrestling fan if you've seen some hardcore matches, especially death matches, uh, how. Michael dispatches of Lenny Clark's wife in this movie. It's it's pretty. It's one of the more brutal kills in the entire film because it's just like yeah, that's nasty. But um, more and more killing. Blah blah blah. blah. Tommy Doyle and the gang show up. Tommy Doyle and uh, Lindsay Wallace and Lonnie and uh, the nurse from the first movie whose name I forget. A uh, Wilson. There's Wilson. I think her name is. I forget. They show up and um. They they lead a vigilante hit squad to go take out Michael Myers. And my biggest beef about this film is that my favorite character in the whole film is Lonnie. Because Lonnie, remember that little bitch in the first film that, you know, uh, Loomis says, you know, Lonnie, get the fuck away from there. Or the fuck he says when he's going to go go to the Myers house. Well, that, he shows up in this film, all grown up. Him and Tommy are friends now. And he's the most redeemable character of the entire movie. And, um... That makes me happy for Lonnie. But you know what? Tommy Doyle, who's the, this is a big part of the film that I don't like, he's like the biggest bitch in the franchise, whether it comes to the first movie or the sixth movie, you know, franchise that doesn't exist anymore. I, I'm sorry, uh, Halloween fanboys. I, I can't keep track of all your fucking starting over bullshit. It's, I, I hate it so much. Uh, he becomes a real hard ass this film. And, and not in a good way. Not even in an entertaining way. And... 
That's my biggest problem about the film. Not the fact that, you know, Michael becomes like, instead of being Michael Myers, becomes Jason Voorhees' film, just fucking murdering everybody in, like, insane ways. And, you know, um, if you want to watch a film called Halloween Kills, you're going to see some kills. You're going to see a lot of kills in this film. And what's missing in the slasher film, the, the slasher of slasher films, is that it's not really... I'm looking for the phrase here I'm looking for now. And I'm a little tired now, so I'm a little more truthful than normal. That every kill seemed like it was telegraphed. And what I mean by that was, you know, you watch a slasher film from before, even when it's even well written. You know, there's that sense of suspense there. There's that sense of, will he or won't he... Or will this character, or won't this character be dead, you know, within the next five minutes? And sometimes, you know, as a, as a horror fan, you want to have those deep fakes, and you get none of that in this movie. When you think somebody's going to die, you know, Michael busting the, busting, uh, the Myers house for these two, uh, you know, alternative lifestyle, they're gay, okay? They're, they're living in this house, and living in this house now, it's all done up, of course. Michael comes home, you say, you don't want him to have a motive. But Michael comes home, and um, there's this whole schmeal about Lori being in the hospital, and the daughter's, oh, convinced he's going to come there and get her. Why would he do that if he doesn't have a motive to kill his sister? I, I don't know, man. It, it's just, yeah. Anywho, Michael's in the house. You know these guys are going to die. Michael comes to somebody else's house. You know they're going to die. There's a point in the end where Michael is down. You know, this is Halloween kills, not Halloween ends. So you know Michael is going to survive this film to go on to the next film for the big showdown with Laurie. You know, it's going to happen. You know, because she has every intention of killing, not her brother. And uh, one of the most satisfying things of the film for me happens. And um, somebody dies and it's the main character and everybody gets a pop in this movie. The nurse gets her pop. Charles Cyphers comes back as not Sheriff Brackett, but now he's like a security guard at the hospital. Uh, he gets his, you know, you, you've seen it if you've seen the reunion trailer they had where he goes, well, it's Halloween, everybody's entitled to one good scare as he brandishes his, his gun at, at Michael. And, yeah, you, you see that in the reunion trailer, so I'm not giving anything away there. But all in all, I, I, I would say... It's 60% of not a waste of my time. So, I'm looking forward to seeing what they do with the next one. I'm not bitching about it. I'm not I'm not even... I, well, I'm bitching a little bit about it. Because there, there's a lot... There's a couple things wrong that I think could be improved. But by not catering to the whole audience. By saying, hey, here's a kill. Hey, here's another kill. Hey, here's another kill. Hey, Michael's stabbing somebody else. A little bit of time taken. You know, with the deep fakes. And even the story, the best part of the story is the flashbacks. It's the best part of the whole story. is the relationship between Will Patton and Jamie Lee Curtis and him being that guy that that was the one that got let the guy go away because he has sympathy and, you know, that, that guilt and that remorse. And their relationship's the best part of the movie. Justice for Lonnie. Love Lonnie in this movie. You know, they made me love Lonnie. You're supposed to hate Lonnie. Lonnie's a little shit that was picking on Tommy Doyle, who's now a badass, you know, I I, I guess. So, Brian Andrews, if you're listening, you know, I'm on your side. <laughs> Let me tell you, in this situation, I'm on your side, and, you know, I hope you get, I hope you get some, some love and some, some, some help with your health and stuff. And But uh, Halloween Kills, if I had to give it a 1 out of 10 uh, rating, it would get a 7.5, 7... Three out of five stars on the on the on the Netflix scale. If you guys use that scale, the old scale, not thumbs up, thumbs down, because that's fucking stupid. Um, yeah, that, that's that's uh, that's my schmeal on Halloween Kills. Uh, other horror news: Ghostbusters Afterlife new trailer looks amazing. Uh, if you haven't seen the echo, check that out. I don't want to give away too much, but you do get to see the Gozer dog again and with chasing Paul Rudd in the trailer, and that's that's always fun. And you get more. And yeah, I hear the, the audience at New York Comic Con that we're at the panel, got to see the movie already, you fucking lucky assholes. It's, it's, it's probably my most exciting thing is to see this this Ghostbusters film. Um, other news and, and horror movies, because you know he's going to make it creepy, y'all. Uh, Rob Zombie ha- has cast his uh, three leads in the Munster film. 
And wouldn't you know it, uh, his wife is there, uh, play Lily Munster. Let me tell you, folks, you know, I, this isn't even, I'm not even going to dump on the woman. But she hasn't proven to me that she has comedic timing. Just because she can cackle like an idiot. And Yvonne DiCarlo, she is not. If you watch the TV show, and I hope, I hope this is where they're going with this. Uh, she played off of Fred Gwynn very well because she had comedic timing. Same thing with Al Lewis. She played off Al Lewis very well, who's played by Daniel Roebuck in this movie, who's a, a great comedic actor, great character actor. Uh, he looks really good. It's probably the best looking at all of them is uh, Grandpa. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing what he does with that character. Right now, cause I know he's a fan. I know Rob Zombie's a fan of the Munsters, but if it turns out like that TV show they put out, which I, I enjoy, but it, it, it wasn't made for just for me and like 12 other people. That Mockingbird Lane show, they got a pilot with uh, Jerry O'Connell, and I can't remember who else was in that, but I happen to enjoy it very much, but it wasn't it wasn't the Munsters that you know. It wasn't, it wasn't funny. It was meant to be serious with some dark comedy put in there. Now, if you're going to have the monsters hacking and slashing and, and being stupid, I think Rob Zombie has a little more respect for the series than that. But the wife, Sherry, she, 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 she has no comedic timing. She's proven nothing to me that she could be even remotely funny. So in this case, I would have picked somebody else, Rob. I'm, I'm just throwing it out there. I'm gonna leave that be though. I'm gonna leave. I'm gonna leave the leave that sit and dwell for you guys for a little while and see, see if you guys uh, will agree or disagree with me. Please comment in the group if you do or you don't. But um, without further ado, I'm gonna give you guys our first review of the show. I cannot find a TV spot for this, but this is a TV movie from 1978. Our reviewer for this uh is, is uh David James Parker who you may know from YouTube and his shows as Mr. Parka. Uh, he is giving us a review of the film, another One Animals. This, this, this episode has a couple of One Animals Attack movies, actually, but this one's a little more When Animals, you know, Get Loose, and that's from 1978's The Beasts Are On The Streets. Take it away, Mr. Parka. All right, so uh, Gary Hill asked me if I'd partake in the 31 Days of Howling uh, Beast for the Halloween uh, kind of monthly special here. And the movie, he gave me the list. There was a bunch of good stuff on there. The, the one I wanted to pick, uh, which I've actually watched a couple times, was Attack of the Beast Creatures, but uh, somebody beat me to that movie. Absolutely ridiculous film that I love. Uh, so I was looking down the list, and there's one that popped out to me that I'd heard a little bit about. It was a TV film from 1978, a thriller. I'd heard some positive things about it. Um, the Beast Are on the Streets. Um, and the plot kind of was reminiscent of a movie I saw from 84, an Italian flick, which I believe is also on the list called The Wild Beast, which is a crazy Italian movie about a bunch of animals getting into LSD, water, laced, or some shit, nut, nut kind of nuts, crazy story like that. So uh, The Beast Are on the Streets. So I, I started this one. I um, It was a TV movie, so I, I definitely kind of was prepared for the kind of TV movie pacing. Um, like I said, 1978, it was directed by a guy named Peter Hunt. So I was looking and his name sounded very familiar. So I looked at a couple of the movies he directed. And I was like, oh, wow, he directed Death Hunt with uh, Charles Bronson and Lee Marvin, which was one of my dad's favorite movies. He always talked about that one. It's a very good film if anybody has not seen that one. So I, I started looking at the cast and there was a couple of familiar, kind of vaguely familiar people in here. But the one that stood out to me was uh, Billy Green Bush, who uh, pops up in stuff like the Culpepper uh, Cattle Company. Company and of course critters for uh, and a bunch of TV and stuff. So the plot of this one is pretty bonkers. Uh, basically, uh, what happens is a, a truck driver who's suffering from some ailment, maybe uh, I don't know, a sleep uh, depraved. Uh, he's sleep depraved, or he has like a heart condition. Um, him and a couple of hunters get into some road rage incidents, and uh, he ends up crashing into kind of this like a wild African safari uh, kind of location. You know where you take like the train, and they show you all the animals and everything like that, a drive through kind of safari, and he takes out the fence uh, completely, and all the animals kind of run amok around the town. It's funny, because this actually had, this kind of stuff has happened a couple times. I remember a few years back, there was this guy who had kind of like a, um exotic kind of animal farm, and he committed suicide, but before he did it, he let all the big cats and a couple of the primates out and everything like that, and unfortunately, those uh, animals had to be uh, put down. In this one, we have all the kind of wildlife people kind of running around and trying to, you know, sedate as many as they can. Um, the cops are also involved, but we kind of have two 
two storylines going on throughout the entire movie. We follow, of course, the uh, safari people trying to save the animals, and they have their own drama and everything like that. Uh, someone's a doctor, and there's a love interest, and some kind of like... They're, they're kind of debating. One wants to move away to kind of go and work on like an actual safari and all that kind of stuff. And then we have the storyline with the two hunters who actually were pretty much partially responsible for this uh, truck driver running off, being ran off the road or having kind of a heart condition or something like that. And uh, one of those is played by Billy Green Bush. And these two guys are just complete morons. Um, throughout the end, most of the movie, I was just hoping they would die. Like they kind of just are those people that really, I don't know if they enjoy the hunt or they enjoy the kill. It seems more so that they're just in it for the killing, not really the meat or any kind of thing when they go out hunting. But uh, it kind of cuts back between these two kind of storylines, and of course they're going to kind of meet at the end. What I really liked about the movie is there's this one point where... um, they have this uh, bear and this tiger kind of run loose into this like it would, it would be like kind of like a carnival setting or like a fair or something like that and all these people are running away from it and the bear and the tiger actually go at it which I was like oh wow that looks very dangerous having these people very close to the animals and everything like that you don't really see that kind of stuff nowadays for good reason but if you watch any of this stuff before probably 19 19- 90 or something the animal movies they're always very dangerous like uh, day of the animals or or stuff like that it just seems like the stunts are really terrifying and the animal wranglers are getting in on it but uh yeah that that, that moment of chaos was really entertaining and, and seeing the bear and the tiger kind of go at it was uh it took me back a little bit you don't typically see that kind of stuff and i found it kind of funny in the very beginning there is a uh, this little voiceover thing that says the humane society or something thanks the humane society because i guess they signed off on it or something along those lines but there's parts when like uh, i believe uh, um uh, a female lion or lioness i guess you'd say is kind of looking for a cub and she runs into this house um and there's a lot of suspense in there and she starts knocking over all these parrot cages and the parrots are in the cages and i'm like you sure nowadays the humane society and PETA would be all over this fucking movie there's no way that kind of stuff would slide but uh, it kind of cracks me up that they put that humane society thing in the very beginning and again i'll make a reference to wild beast um i remember uh that movie the director franco prosperi um who directed um one the Mondo Kani movies. I believe he was responsible for that big kind of Mondo wave in the early 60s mentioned that none of the animals were actually harmed in that movie and if you ever watch a Mondo movie you know it's all bullshit manipulation but still I would never trust that guy. So like seeing that humane society thing in the beginning I'm like it sure look like there's some animals possibly being hurt in this movie. Um, I don't know if that's the you know but regardless um, that's just uh, it's a very much a product of its time with the stunts and everything. Um, I will say that the movie runs a little bit slow and and it does kind of get a little bit repetitive and, and stuff like that. But uh, for the most part, I, I did find it uh, kind of uh, pretty much entertaining. I, I it was a little above average. I liked it. I would probably come in at like a three out of five or a six, six and a half out of ten, somewhere on that range. And I got to give it a lot of respect for the crazy opening of the fence going down and all the animals running amok on the streets. And and uh, there's this one moronic guy that gets out of his car, kind of like um uh, that horrible story. Or it was on one of the those death i think it was traces of death which is terribly disgusting you shouldn't watch that i i never finished it but i remember seeing the clip where the guy gets out on the african safari ride and he starts filming the lions and he gets killed and his family's watching this moron the police tell him do not get out of the car in any and any under circumstances no circumstances do not get out of the car he gets out and of course he's attacked you're just like you know i just hope you don't have kids because you don't need to pass on any of them dumb genetics i'm kidding i'm kidding uh <laughs> but yeah, like I said, this one's pretty enjoyable. You get all sorts of different animals in here. Uh, you know, lions, tigers, and you get some some bears and stuff like that. Uh, there's ostriches. Yeah, there, there's lots of stuff running amok here. But uh, yeah, it's it's fairly entertaining. I wouldn't say it's, it's not incredibly violent. Like, there's not a high body count or anything like that. I think only possibly one one person actually dies in the film. Uh, Billy Green Bush does kind of semi-redeem himself at the end, but for the most part, he is full douchebag. Um, both the hunters kind of are. Uh, there is this kind of, I, I got the comment on the truck driver in the very beginning. I'm pretty sure that was Hans Moleman, the live action version of Hans Moleman from the Simpsons. He just had such a unique look and he just, I don't know how to explain it. They just don't make character actors like that anymore. But yeah, so the beast around the streets from 1978, I believe this uh, actually got a DVD release from Warner Archive or one of those made on demand companies. It's never had a Blu-ray to my knowledge, but it's a pretty decent TV flick from 1978. Not as horror as one would expect, 
more of kind of the thriller area with some drama. But definitely worth checking out if it sounds like it's up your alley. I personally would lean more towards Wild Beast because it's more exploitative and crazy and just violent and Italian. And that's that's more my kind of jam. This one, I mean, it, it is like, um, I guess, would I, would, I, would I compare it to something like uh, Shadows of the Kilimanjaro, the uh, uh, killer baboon movie? Maybe somewhat like that, but it's less of a siege movie. So I guess it's kind of its own deal. Um, this and Wild Beast would make a kind of a good double feature if you take the American kind of tame TV version and then pop in Wild Beast and you say, that's how the Italians would do it, you know. But uh, yeah, there's another one that I've always wanted to check out um, that always, I, I don't know if it was on the list or not. I, I don't think I saw it was Savage Harvest, which is, uh, um, you know, an 80s, early 80s one, not to be confused with the Eric Stanzi SOV movie, but there's this one with these, uh, I think like lions trap these people in the house with Tom Skerritt. I've always wanted to watch that one. So yeah, but I, I was uh, happy to watch this one finally and uh, can check it off uh, the list of movies to check out. So I uh, want to thank Gary for asking me to do this. I enjoyed it and I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, if you guys don't know, I'm Mr. Parka. I probably should have said that in the very beginning, but uh, I'm sure Gary will, uh, will fill you guys in. I have a YouTube channel where I do re weekly reviews and I also am uh, one of the co-hosts on 22 Shots of Moods and Horror. So yeah, check it out if you're interested. If not, do whatever you want. I hope you enjoyed this and uh, happy Halloween and all that good stuff. So yeah. Years away, I approach your planet. The birds of the air, the animals of the forest, they shall be my ears and my eyes. And because I see your most secret acts, you will know me as the beast with a million eyes. From worlds beyond comes a weird and wanton intelligence, a beast with a million eyes, making of a woman's dog her attacker, setting a fire flames of wild desire, making of a man's friend, a violator of every code of decency, guilty of acts you'll never believe. See a man fight against supernatural forces for the girl he loves. See a beast with a million eyes control a ship from outer space. One of the most fantastic terror thrills the screen has ever brought you. See the beast with a million eyes. Yes, the film I'm reviewing on this episode, well, one of two, is uh, The Beast with a Million Eyes from 1955. Uh, your cheapo IMDb plot synopsis says... Wah, 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 wah. A dysfunctional family operating an isolated date farm in the California desert are threatened by the arrival of an extraterrestrial. Kind of. Uh, it's more the form of like a, a, a probe that comes down and you know, messes a lot of things. And you, you hear in the trailer that it, it, will, it will mess with the animals and the lower beings. Um, and it does. This is like one of the... I'd say one of the first uh, When Animals Attack movies, because, you know, the dog goes nuts, on, and uh, the birds go nuts in this movie. That's about the biggest, you know, thing with the animals going crazy. Uh, but this, star, this stars uh, Paul Birch, who was in Not of This Earth, and The Man Who Shot Liberty Valens, and some other good stuff. Uh, Dick Sargent is a big player in this movie, as, as Deputy Larry Brewster. Uh, Leonard Tarver plays a, a character in this film, and called him because he really doesn't have a name. This is AKA Carl, but they call him him because him can't talk. He's simple. He, he might be, uh, slightly mentally handicapped. And, uh, this film is all that he's known for. And I can tell because the acting is, he kind of walks around like, to, like Tor Johnson a bit in this movie and doesn't really say much. He's accused of doing things. And, uh, <laughs> it says uncredited, uh, London, uh, as the dog, as Duke the dog in the movie, is a German Shepherd, and he's a good boy until, you know, the alien starts to mess with his head and, you know, makes him want to attack people. And, um, yeah, the, the daughter, Sandra Kelly, Do Do Dona, Cole, Dona Cole, uh, it's not known for a whole bunch either. Uh, <laughs> she's on a show called, what, what, for, for, for 1958, called The Bob Cummings Show as Bathing Suit Girl. That, that'll tell you something, right? She's a great actress. She's not really a great actress, though. <laughs> the biggest two of the film I mentioned, Paul Birch and Dick Sargent, they wrote a bunch of things. Uh, this was directed by many people because uh, the, the guy, David Karmarski, says credit only on IMDb. 
Uh, didn't really cut the mustard because this is a Roger Corman, Roger Corman production before American International ever really existed. And, um, and here it says some scenes uncredited, but I think Roger was the money man. He did not like the way the film was turning out. So Roger stepped in and pretty much took over the film in the direction. And I I thank him for this because, you know, it's so far so good, right, guys? Um, it's it's a, it's a fun film. And I, I, really, I really enjoyed what I watched. Basically, this thing comes down from the sky. You get the whole cold open with the thing talking from space. You see an eyeball staking out. It's telling you everything it's going to do and then more. Got to take over the animals. You know, the lower beings first and the, the weak-minded. The weak-minded being him, who's a farmhand on their farm. And a guy that they, they let stay at their place because you find out in a... In, you know, not in a nothing scene. There's no really no nothing scenes in this film. Alan Kelly, the father of the farmer, uh, um, he did, uh, him did something for him once, or, or whatever his name is, you know. Um, and this is why he lets him stay in the in the side house there. And then and it's, that's a nice little story in here. Uh, but the big, big crux of the film is this thing is emitting a, a signal to the different things that come across it. It's not really a long wave signal because it only happens when they go near it. The dog goes near it. He's a good boy at first, but when he comes back, he he attacks the mother, uh, forcing her to kill the dog with, with a gun. And um, that's very sad. The dog dies, but he, it's, he was once a good boy, but then he wasn't a good boy anymore. Um, birds uh, attack cars in this film. You, know, you see, like, Really poorly shot, like, uh, nature shots, and all of a sudden this swooping black thing is coming against the car. It's like, oh, the birds are going crazy, and blah, 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 blah. Well, it's all thanks to this thing, and it, it takes control of him, who, uh, like, I said, like I said, he's simple. He's he's lazy. His mind doesn't work. Is it as strong as others? And he tries to hurt the family, you know, and kidnap the daughter, because they always think that him is... is it's a little funny. He might be a little perverted or might, little, might, might sexually assault or something. They don't say sexual assault in this movie, but that's pretty much what, what the mother's thinking. That since Sandra is kind of like nice to, 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 to him, that he's going to use his simple mind and try to do something bad to her. And that, that, that happens only under the influence of uh, an alien, um, alien, the beast, if you will. Um a voice by Bruce Whitmore, who has no other credits besides the Beast with a Million Eyes. I'm saying that like it's a bad thing, like this movie really sucks, but it really does. It actually plays it really smart, you know, for a film that's that's like this. You know, you you find out at the end that you know the reason why the reason why that there's a Sentinel that has come down because the only thing's left is this Beast from its planet, and he wants to like repopulate it with lower beings, and it, it, it's a uh, it's it's worth your time. It's on Tubi right now. I, I I'd hate to. It's a three point seven IMDb. That's not really fair. And only really thing you wish. It's it's kind of like um. It's kind of like when I mentioned earlier. I, I reviewed a couple like some days back. Uh, Blood Beast from Outer Space. You know, you wish it was called something else. Which you, you understand why it's called the Beast with a Million Eyes, because the ploy of the Beast, which is this you know lone beast from this planet is to take over all the lower beings and for them to be his eyes hence the beast with a million eyes i get it i get why they call it that but if you look at the the, the poster again it's got this thing it looks like it looks like a uh, like a bleeding cat with razor sharp teeth going after a woman and uh what, what does it say here uh it says an unspeakable horror destroying terrifying the beast with a million eyes um, this is my best attempt at tra the trailer guy voice, but, um, the best thing I could do is tell you to check it out because it don't cost you nothing. You can go watch it on Tubi right now, possibly on YouTube, but some of the, the scenes in this film, you know, they, they, they were on a budget. I'm warning you now. And, uh, a lot of, um, I'm looking for the, the, the technical phrase for when you put one video over another video. There's a lot of that going on in this film. So it's cheaply made. But the story's really good, and I, I would recommend you checking it out. That's The Beast with a Million Eyes from 1955 on YouTube. And up next, I am going to give you my man, 
from many, many things, including uh, one I do with, with uh, called Blood from the Core, on uh, Legion Patreon. Go, go subscribe to Legion Patreon. You'll get all those Blood from the Core episodes that are coming, I promise. Next month we're doing at least two. Uh, Derek, Derek Bourgeois uh, covering Sea Beast right now. I lost a crewman. Now I want to know what happened. Oh, it was a shark. It wasn't a shark, Ben. And whatever it was, I think this thing followed me back to town. I thought you and Aaron were going to the island with us. She's going to leave with you guys tonight. I'll meet up with her in the morning. Hello? Drew's dead. We gotta find this thing before it kills somebody else. You are gonna get yourself killed. Come on, you dumb fish. Ben? That creature's headed to the island. What's going on, Cinema Beef listeners? That is right. Derek Bourgeois here to give you my review for the 31 Days of Howling Beasts annual Halloween extravaganza. <laughs> yeah. Uh, big shout out to Gary for letting me do this. I actually picked a movie that uh, I actually have seen before. I've seen this uh, funny story about this movie before I give my review. Uh I watched this with a guy I used to work with uh, at, when I used to work uh, at Stop and Shop. We went to his house and we watched, uh, got shit faced and stoned. <laughs> and uh, we watched a bunch of sci fi channel movies. I remember I watched this with the movie Swamp Devil. But uh, we're not here to talk about Swamp Devil. We're here to talk about, of course, a movie with Beast in the title. And this is Sea Beast from 2008. Eight. Yes, this is uh, directed and co-written by Paul Ziller. Uh, and I know this movie because it's part of the Maneater series. If you ever seen like uh, that DVD line, uh, they have like a bunch of these like early sci-fi channel creature features that came out. And uh, this is one of them. Uh, like a uh, Blood Monkey was another one. Uh, there's a few different ones. Windworm. There's a few, uh, Carney. There's, there's a bunch of these, uh, DVDs. You'll notice them because they have, like, like this brown border with a little circle at the top that says Maneater Series. Uh, but yeah. Sea Beast. Uh, little plot synopsis. <laughs> Mythic creatures emerge from the sea to feast on the residents of a fishing village. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much, uh, what happens. Uh, the main star of this movie is Corin Nimick. Who uh, started a bunch of these? I remember him mostly from like Sand Sharks with uh, Brooke Hogan. <laughs> uh, yeah, and he's in a uh, House of Bones. His character in that's pretty fucking fun. Uh, you know, he, he's he's kind of a big name star for these type of movies. Nothing wrong with that. You got to eat somehow, you know. But uh, yeah, Sea Beast. Uh, it opens up with this great scene where, like, this guy is just doing, like, a... You know, they're on, like, this fishing trip. Like, kind of like the perfect storm setup. Where they're in the middle of, like, this hurricane trying to fish for fish. And Corman Nemec's character of uh, Will ends up... He's, like, the head of the captain of the ship. And he ends up fucking, uh... Seeing something take one of his crew off 
his ship during the storm. And uh, this is where it gets a little tricky with the movie. Because then you notice, wait a minute, what the hell is that? Because you could definitely see it, but it's transparent. Uh, yeah, these uh, monsters kind of have like a invisibility cloak. They're kind of like Predator mixed with like the uh, the Lapasaurus from Jurassic Park because they spit venom at you. But this time the venom actually works on people unlike Jurassic Park. Uh, it's very high toxic venom, the stuff that they spit out. Very green algae. Uh, yeah, so the, then you get the subplot to where, you know, uh, Will's character is in his debt. He has a young daughter that he's trying to pay to go to college uh, who ends up finding out she's dating one of his crew members, Danny, in the film. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's hilarious because what ends up happening is uh, Danny, Carly, her friend Aaron, and uh, Drew, who's uh, the other crew member that works with Danny, who's Aaron's boyfriend, and they're going, sneaking away to Will's cabin for the week and, and on this secret island. And uh, Will's like, I gotta go back out there. I gotta get my big catch. He has to pay with, like, Carly's fun to get the, pay for the boat that he's using for the dock master, who's kind of a dickhead. That dude's a piece of shit in this movie, and he he's pretty bad, you know. Uh, he's actually one of the worst actors in the movie, too, ironically enough. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, that goes on, and then, you know, he ends up kind of helping out this woman scientist named Arden, who's kind of studying the algae while they're discovering bodies as they go. And then, of course, they find out and discover that there's this giant troglodyte, a.k.a. It's kind of a mixture of, like, a golem from Lord of the Rings and an anglerfish. Uh, they even kind of describe it looking like an anglerfish in the movie, and it, it kind of does. It's Gollum if he fucked an anglerfish. That's what these creatures are. Uh, <laughs> they're pretty goofy looking, especially when you notice the CGI they do. But they do mix it in with some puppetry in this one. This is early sci-fi channel when they still kind of did that. Uh, it's mostly the terrible CGI. But it does look good in some shots. Is it actually a great shot near the end of the movie where the big mama creature actually is crawling onto the boat? And it actually looks pretty good. It was just some of the fast-paced CGI wasn't the greatest when, you know, you have, like, these little little troggies running and shit like that. It looks kind of cheap, and you can tell. But, you know, for what it is... I don't mind it, you know, I, I knew what I was getting myself into when I picked this, either way, I knew there was going to be some kind of shitty CGI in the film, uh, if you, that's not your thing, then, yeah, I get it, but, you know, I don't mind it, especially with, like, the these kind of budget sci-fi channel movies, but they do have some good practical gore, there's actually a, uh, this is a great scene where, uh, there's actually another side character in this movie I forgot to mention, where of course you know, uh, it has a, it's fucking great. There's this guy that kind of looks like if John Savage and Robert Shaw as Quint from Jaws had a baby, and put it together, that's what this guy looks like. He's like a mixture of John Savage if he played Quint from Jaws and dressed up exactly like Robert Shaw. It's pretty great. <laughs> Uh, he's like another fisherman who's uh, actually seen the same stuff Will has. I, I believe his name has been in the movie. Uh, he ends up doing like this whole escapade where he puts himself inside of a cage on top of the dock with like a, you know, a harpoon gun. And he's going to be like fucking going to face this creature head on. There's this little old lady named Judy that's kind of... Actually, her husband's the one that died in the beginning of the film. And uh, this is so fucked up. But uh, it's great. Uh, what ends up happening is Judy's like, Will, get out. Ben, get out of there. No, because Judy called Will to try to... Well, she's getting in touch with the sheriff. I forgot to tell you. This creature takes out like this whole town. 
this whole town and pretty much every character that we saw in the bar earlier during like the funeral scenes are getting fucking killed. It's pretty great. <laughs> and uh, this movie is very deep, uh, <laughs> as you can tell. And uh, what ends up happening is uh, <laughs> it's so great. It's a, uh, yeah, the. Will's brother, the sheriff, ends up. We, we, he gets torn apart. We see him dead, and Will picks up the microphone. Yeah, uh, my brother's dead, but what can I do for you? And she's like, Ben's locked himself inside of a cage. He's gone crazy. So Will's trying to go back to the docks just in time. Judy tells, goes out to tell Ben that Will's coming, and the creature's behind uh, this Judy lady and <laughs> jumps down beside her. Uh, he she can't see him at first because they like have that predator thing where they're invisible. Uh, this creature just takes its whole mouth and puts its mouth onto Judy's head. Decapitation and there's blood squirts. It's fucking great. Uh, it's one of the best scenes in the movie. I was actually kind of taken back because I didn't. Even, I don't even think I seen that scene originally when I seen that because I did actually watch it on Sci Fi Channel and they cut a lot of the gore out of like their uh, pre uh, what's it called their TV movies pretty much. So I think that was actually added back in. I'm not too sure though on that because I did see that a long time ago. But uh, yeah, it ends with the like you know because Danny and Carly are kind of like the last survivors they're on the island fighting off all these like little baby troglodyte creatures they end up ending up in this climax where there's like this ancient fairy that will actually used to work on on the island that's kind of abandoned it's a pretty major shithole uh by the way the dialogue in this movie is kind of hilarious too in some scenes it's fucking great especially those carly and danny scenes uh yeah, and you know, Danny doesn't end up making it through the movie, unfortunately. He ends up getting taken. Uh, we don't actually see him die. He gets tongued and lifted up to the roof. But the whole climax of the movie is fucking great, too, because, you know, Will kind of does like a MacGyver fucking method where he actually creates like this fucking bomb that works and ends up saving the day. Because they end up finding out the fear is actually the nest of where this creature's laying its eggs. And they had to destroy it in order to stop the creature from reproducing because, you know, he had a bunch of babies already. And then when you see that it's like 4,000 eggs underneath, you know, in that sense. But, yeah, you know, he has like this great moment where he's setting it up and he's smoking his cigar. And he kills the creature and saves the day. He's the hero of the movie, Coleman Nemec for life. And this movie pretty much ends with him running a fit his fishing boat again and uh the scientist lady and uh his daughter are actually his crew now so uh what's that tell you about this movie <laughs> it ends with that kind of ending you know big happy family ending uh yeah sea beast am i gonna say this movie is well made or amazing probably not but was i fucking entertained as all hell watching it hell to the yes so I'm going to rate it on entertainment level because I can't really rate these type of movies on like a technical scale because they were made for TV for one thing with super low budgets and what they did get, you know, it entertained me. You know, it, if you don't not a fan of shitty CGI, don't watch it, you know, but if you're like me and you're like, eh, whatever, you know, it's whatever, you know, like I, I do, I am the guy that complains about CGI and like more budgeted movies and movies that came to theater, you know, it's like, why does that look so terrible now? You know, and you know, in that sense, but this is a TV movie. I kind of understand why it's there. You know, it's not like, you know, they made this movie to go to fucking theaters either, you know, in that sense. But overall, I was highly entertained with this movie. It kept my interest. The characters made me laugh especially with their terrible dialogue. It was fun for what it was. So if I had to rate this movie, of course I'm going to give it like a 7 out of 10. It was a fun-ass time. And uh, 
I recommend it. You can watch it on, I think, Pluto TV. Uh, I, know, I actually ended up watching my DVD copy, but I did also see that it was on Epix. If you have a, like an on-demand Epix account or a subscription to Epix. Uh, it was on a bunch of them. You you could find them on like one of those free streaming sites. Usually, It's usually on uh, Tubi too sometimes. Uh, it wasn't on when I checked before, but you could check this out on streaming anywhere. Uh, if you have free screaming, I even think you can watch it on IMDb for free too, actually. Uh, I actually, yeah, you can, cause I'm actually on IMDb right now. Cause they have that IMDb TV fucking thing, but <laughs> enough of that. If you want to have a good time, drink some beers and watch CBs, go ahead. Seven out of 10. I had fun with it for what it was. Uh, of course, I am Derek Bourgeois. If you don't know my shows, you can find me on Cinema Attack, uh, Celluloid Dissections Redux, which are going to be on the same feed, of course. Uh, no More Room in Hell. Uh, no More Room in Hell presents Creature Comforts. Also, uh, we have a great one there with uh, uh, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, of course, has returned. Finally, I'm very excited that that's actually coming back. Uh, and also, they're here, podcast, you know. Uh, and of course, you can find me on the Legion Patreon, where I do, uh, with Mr. Gary Hill, Blood from the Core, which is a show that we look at New York-based horror and thriller films. Probably record our next episode soon of that. Just been busy as all hell with the October shows, you guys. But, you know, give us a break. We'll get there soon. Uh, as always, I hope you enjoy the rest of uh, the 31 days of Howling Beasts, and uh, enjoy the rest of the shows on Legion Podcasts. Always good stuff, so I'll see you next time, guys. Peace out. When the evil in a man has so rotted away his soul that even death cannot bring him release, he suffers the cruelest curse ever placed upon mortal man by the host of darkness. He becomes the Beast of the Yellow Knight. What happened to his face? Mangled beyond recognition in an industrial accident. He returned from the dead to possess the body, the life, and the woman of another. But his desire made him a savage beast, condemned to stalk the night with an insatiable lust for living flesh. Nobody could have done that with his bare hands. What kind of a weapon would you need to rip out a man's heart with a single blow? John Ashley and Mary Wilcox. Beast of the Yellow Knight. See it with someone you trust. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're thinking. Why, why is this asshole on here again? You, we should, we want to hear reviews from good podcasters, and you you will get those in, in abundance, y'all. And uh, but I'm gonna give you guys another one, being the, for, from a film from 1971 called The Beast of the Yellow Knight. It's another Filipino monster film. film. Uh, this one written, directed, produced, and starring because he has to be everything in the film. Uh, Mr. Eddie Romero, uh, he's in there somewhere. Uh, 
Your basic cheapo plot synopsis is this. Where are we at here now? Satan saves a man from death on condition he becomes his disciple. As it turns out, a hairy murderous beast. Ah, uh, this stars John Ashley, who um, hasn't done much great acting. He's produced many great things like uh, The A-Team and Apocalypse Now. Apparently he liked working in the Philippines doing the Apocalypse Now thing. Uh, Mary Charlotte Wilcox who plays Julia Rogers in the film. She is most known for being on SCTV, the, the, the Canadian TV variety show, like the SNL, but SCTV. Vic D, as I mentioned, as, as Satan. <laughs> uh, I mentioned um, when I was promoting this that he looks like a, like an international Derek Bourgeois, and I, he really does, man, especially in the beginning. Um, Andres Centinera as Blind Man, which I wish they, they actually gave him a name in the credits because he's kind of an important character. Um, he's the guy that comes across our, our, our friend Joseph here while he's in beast form and doesn't really care that he's in beast form. He just wants to like to, him for not to bother him, not to bother him. And, and then he ends up kind of helping him out, you know, and, but not really if you get to the very end of this movie, because he kind of is the cause of his, the beast demise. Cause you know, the beast has to go by the time this movie's over. Um, yeah, this film starts out with a guy who, and, and a girl, they're getting, they're getting shot at and, on the brink of death, um, our hero here, he, 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 he <laughs> the funny thing about this plot, it kind of reminds me of Knight Rider a little bit. Like, if Michael Knight, My, well, Michael Long is Michael Knight's actual name, ma- made a deal with the devil and not with Knight Industries that to become a different guy and, you know, go go fight the world. Th- this, this, um, <laughs> This is this is a little different because he makes a deal with Satan when Satan, when Vic Diaz pops up it looks looks like he's like wearing like an Indian headband a uh, Native American headband <clears throat> and and um, offers him to save him and and, and uh, to, to change him if only he would eat the most delicious meat you know where I'd imagine he see he sees this pile of of I imagine it's human flesh that just say hey go eat it. It just seems like a good idea because those berries you just ate were kind of poisonous. Go eat that giant pile of random mystery meat. So now our man has a taste for human flesh, and uh, he, and uh, he 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 comes home to to his lady after he's presumed dead, but he's alive. He has a new face who you find out was not this this very nice guy. He was a really kind of a criminal piece of shit. And then all of a sudden, you know. Whenever he gets the urge of doing a little hanky panky or he gets angry, his stomach starts to hurt and he becomes the beast of the yellow knight. And the beast itself, let me tell you, it kind of reminds you like the Incredible Hulk a little bit without any muscles. But if, you know, the Hulk like stuck his face in some oatmeal, you know, to get the crusties on his face and, and dyed his face green, that's what the beast of the yellow knight kind of looks like. So when he, uh, when he turns into the beast, he goes out and he craves human flesh, of course, and he's going to get his human flesh, uh, not knowing, you know, what he is. It, it, it's more of a Wolfman movie if you think about it, but he's not a Wolfman. He's this green-faced, you know, killer, not knowing what he's doing. So if you pick a Wolfman film, you pick American Werewolf in London even, because, you know, this whole time he's this has happened to him, you know, she, the, Julia is like the Jen, Jenny Agata of the movie, where she she's in love, very much in love with him, but but not realizing what's going on until the very end of the movie. And she realizes what he is. There's, there's points of the film where he's on, he's on the lamb. They know he's up to no good, but not necessarily mutilating people. He comes, comes home in a bloody shirt. Like, yeah, you know, lock me up, man. You know, I'm doing bad things. And he, uh, <clears throat> meets up with the blind man. As I mentioned before, the blind man don't care what he's at. He, he just wants to kind of, keep him where he is and he has no judgment because he doesn't know what he looks like and that's all that's the point in the movie and it, it ends with you know our creature not doing so good because they 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 kill his blind friend and he figures out not just you know his his stomach boners turn him into the beast but his anger turns him into the beast as well because when he, they shoot his friend the, the filipino army he, he gets upset and then this is uh what causes him, I guess, and weakens him, I guess, because this whole time the beast can take as many bullets as he wants to and not die, and all of a sudden the beast can get ki- shot and killed. Maybe he's halfway in and out. I don't know. I didn't write this movie. I just know that I like to watch it. 
it's a it's, it's it was a great joy to watch uh 1971's beast the beast of the yellow knight free to watch on prime video and i think on tubi as well if you like a filipino monster movie like i like a filipino monster movie i say check it out it's uh yeah man it's really good but uh without further ado i'll move on to another one of my uh great great friends here Mr. Court Psyops uh, giving us his review of the Paul Nashi film, Night of the Howling Beast, which has an alternate title, The Yeti and the Werewolf. And you will hear that wrap this trailer. The full red moon will soon shine in the sky. The demons will come out of their hiding places and their howls will be heard in the night announcing death. My men are afraid and do not wish to go. What mysteries lie hidden in legendary Tibet? <laughs> what horrible demons terrorize men who don't think twice about risking their lives? <laughs> Frightened men pray to their gods with their ritual dances against the evil spirits. The werewolf and the yeti. <laughs> Karakoram is a land of ferocious and brutal men whose law is violence and crime. Larry, listen. I don't see the bodies of Melody or the professor. Tell me, where are they? Alice. Sucker, gone. Shut up. Death is the kindest end to those prisoners in the dungeons of the palace of the Sakar Khan, where a beautiful and evil woman submits her victims to the most diabolical tortures. We saw the body of the messenger, and he wasn't killed by a wolf. It was you. In the werewolf and the yeti, there is terror, eroticism, and adventure, bringing together the audience and the actors in a nightmarish atmosphere. The werewolf and the yeti. The yeti, the mythical being of the mountains of Tibet, meets the werewolf in a bestial and diabolical battle. Paul Nashi in his most recent creation of The Werewolf, with Grace Mills, Sylvia Solar, and a great supporting cast. Only I know of a remedy for your illness. A remedy? What is it? There exists a magic plant with red flowers. When its petals are mixed with the blood of a young girl, they can cure those like you who have been contaminated by the demons of Karakaram. Love. In The Werewolf and the Yeti.
right, so it is night of the Howling Beast that we are talking about right now tonight on this 31 Days of Howling Beast. Special shout out to my man Gary for giving me the opportunity to talk about this Paul Nashy film. I feel that the Night of the Howling Beast, a.k.a. La Maledicción de Bestia, also known as uh, Werewolf and the Yeti in some circles as well, is a more seen, though less appreciated, I think, from a lot of fans' perspectives, a uh, Paul Nashy film. It happens to be one of the ones that I enjoy the most, and it happens to be one of my favorites. I'm not the only one that I know of that uh, happens to really enjoy this flick. Uh, the thing that's very interesting about Night of the Howling BC, aka The Malediction of the Bestia, aka Werewolf and the Yeti, is, well, the last title tells you, there's a fucking Yeti in this, too. So we get Werewolf versus Yeti. Werewolf fighting Yeti scene. No, that's not enough to sell you? Okay. Uh, did I mention that there's a shitload of tits in it? Just about every actress that's in the film? Yeah. Tits get out. Oh, did I also mention Paul Nashi has a three-way with uh, these witchy werewolf women sort of things that turn him into a werewolf? Yeah, he has three-way werewolf sex and therefore becomes a werewolf. He gets werewolfism as a sexually transmitted disease in this, I think. I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure that's what I saw. Wanted to tell everybody out there, uh, if you're going to look up and try and find Werewolf in the Yeti, a.k.a. La Maledicción de Bestia, a.k.a. The Night of the Howling Beast, you definitely want to get yourself the Blu-ray version. Now, there are some overseas that I think are released through companies in Spain and whatnot, but um, for the most of us all over the world, there was a box set of Paul Nashi films, uh, Collection 1 and Collection 2, that Scream Factory did. And uh, it's available in the Scream Factory Collection 2. And uh, it's the best I've ever seen it look. It looks incredible. It's a really well-done transfer. The film is 4x3. I uh, don't know if that's how they always intended it to be or if that's just the only copies of it that they could find to do this restoration from, but uh, it looks excellent. The shots are really well done. Uh, the only problem is obviously day for night is very much the day and not the night, but we're going to have that in these kind of Spanish-made horror films. The gore in it is excellent. There is a lot of exploitative elements that are in this that you can really grab a hold of and get your teeth and sink them into. Uh, this is very much like a Republic serial that they ended up amping up the high concept moments to. I mean, that's basically how Republic serials work. They're like, hey, let's put a werewolf in a cage with a Yeti and let him fight a fight, see how it goes. Where this film is like, let's put a werewolf in the Himalayas, in Tibet and Nepal, and have him fight a fucking Yeti. And while we're at it, Let's make him a werewolf because he had a three-way with two werewolf-like women that worship the goddess of death and the god of death, Moloch. Oh, and while we're at it, let's throw in a happy ending. Oh, and we'll, we'll have a con that is got some kind of weird infection that it requires women to be tortured and filleted in order to make him better somehow. A power-hungry uh, evil woman who is Grimma Wormtonguing him. And, and by Grimma Wormtonguing, I mean the person who was manipulating the leader of Rohan, not Grimma Wormtonguing like in a sexual way. Although she might have been doing that too, who knows? But that's not important right now. What's important is all of these amazing high concept ideas, all of these really weird kind of strange elements, they mix together really well in this film. And I know a lot of you are thinking that this stuff isn't going to mix together. It's not going to work. But I mean, they go on an expedition into the Himalayas. They end up running afoul of the Khan. Nashi's main character gets stuck out in this huge storm trying to find a pass to do this research work that they're trying to do. And so that's how he runs into these uh, werewolfy women and all of that kind of stuff. See the Yeti right off the bat uh, and know that he's about. And that's why some of the Sherpas are terrified to help him. I mean, all of these different disparaging ideas and all this stuff just kind of comes together. And it's all wrapped together with this Republic serial, like super fun, high adventure, high concept kind of movie. So like picture the kind of stuff that influenced like Raiders of the Lost Ark and Indiana Jones films. Only it's with a fucking werewolf as your head guy. He's your main adventurer, right? I mean, how much more pulpy can you get, right? That's the that's the thing I'm getting at. It's like, this is a pulpy Republic cereal, freaking tits and blood in it, guys and gals. I mean, come on, everybody. Let's just all huddle up in the middle here and just really enjoy the greatness that is Night of the Howling Beast. I mean, we're talking 87 minutes of pure good joy. And it's just something that you got to check out. 
And for goodness sakes, why are you even listening to me talk about it? Go find Werewolf and the Yeti, a.k.a. La Maledictione de Bestia, a.k.a. Night of the Howling Beast. Find it. It's out there. It's available for you on Blu-ray and a couple of other different formats as well. And it's worth your time. It's one of Minashi's more energetic and fun performances as the werewolf. He fights a fucking Yeti. Come on. Massive, monstrous man beasts like this invade us. Flown a captive to a West Coast metropolis in an army cargo plane, his arrival catapults the whole city into an ocean of fear. For this colossal beast is at war with the world, our world, a world his savage instincts can only hate. An airlift is being set up and food will be parachuted down to him. He'll be supplied with everything he needs. Get all the aircraft into the air at once. The colossal man is loose in Los Angeles. the civilized world in blood freezing horror as the immeasurable power of this colossal beast threatens a war of brutality such as we've never known. Hello, everybody. This is Nudie from the NFW Podcast, and I'm here putting in my segment of Gary Hill's Cinema Beef, the Halloween, beastly Halloween special, I guess. Uh, my pick was 1958's War of the Colossal Beast. But before we start with that one, there was an original movie called The Amazing Colossal Man from 1957, which was screenplayed by Bert I. Gordon, who also directed the film. And if anybody knows about him, he likes to do camera tricks and use oversized props and stuff. And he's a pretty, pretty damn good uh, writer slash director. Uh, the main character is named Colonel Glenn Manning. He survives a nuclear blast, and but he begins to uncontrollably grow into an increasingly unstable giant. Now, this is being a 1950s movie. This is in black and white. Um, the first movie has some pretty cool size effects and oversized props and stuff like that and uh you're to believe that he died in the first movie but no no it made i guess it did so well in the drive-in circuit that they rushed to put this movie out real fast because they wanted to cash in i guess so in 1958 we get war of the colossal beast the only difference in this movie is they recast the part of Glenn Manning Duncan Parkin plays the in this movie and I don't know, I know it's hard to find out why they replaced him but maybe he just didn't want to do it again I don't know but uh yeah so this movie everybody believes that he's dead after he fell from the Hoover Dam but he somehow re-emerges in Mexico he's brain damaged disfigured and he's very hungry so basically a bunch of food trucks get robbed and couple of the survivors talk about this giant man so they finally realize hey he actually survived that fall and he's out there so they the army makes up a a plan to capture him and bring him back to america so they do they drug him and they fly him (laughs) 
like kind of like they did with King Kong, I guess, on a plane back to uh, America, where he escapes and, you know, the war begins, even though there's not much of a war. There's a lot of cool scenes in this movie of of the giant just walking around and and destroying uh, like Las Vegas type neon signs. Uh, he doesn't really talk in this movie because he's kind of damaged, and like I said, his half his face is disfigured. He only says one word in the whole movie, and that's his sister's name. And uh, yeah, so the name uh, is uh, Janice. Joyce, Joyce, called his sister Joyce, the only name. So the army uses Joyce to try to get him to, if they can get the, you know, Glenn Manning back, but it doesn't really happen. So by them replacing the main character, they used heavy makeup on the actor so that they could try to disguise that it was a different actor because they do show a lot of flashback scenes in this movie from the first one, a la... Silent Night, Deadly Night 2. And uh, the base makeup was actually recycled from a movie called The Cyclops that uh, Bert I. Gordon, I think, believe he did as well. And the same person who was in that movie, Dean Parkin, you know, wore the same makeup. So I guess it saved them money since it was already made for him. So they didn't have to redo a whole new person. So yeah, um, like I said, Bert I. Gordon does the old camera tricks with the, the depth range and oversized props and small props to make everything look big and small um that's kind of this movie is only uh, like a hundred and hundred minutes 108 minutes us uh, restrike that it's only about 68 minutes so it's not really that long um it goes by pretty fast even though you have a lot of the flashbacks it's a classic movie so if you're an older fella you might rec- realize this movie was on tv a lot back in the day like creature feature movies um yeah, it's not a bad bad film at all. Bert I. Gordon is a really good writer director, and this is his you know forte. Um, yeah, let's see. In the final scene, they do you know a, a special where the movie's in black and white, and then when he gets killed at the end of the movie, if he gets killed, it turns into color for like less than a minute. It's just a whole color scene at the end, so it's kind of like back in the fifties, like woo color. So yeah. Um, War of the Colossal Beast. Probably check this movie out if you've never seen it. It's pretty interesting. Um, but look for Amazing Colossal Man first, and then watch this one with it right after. Make a good one-two punch. But yeah, I mean, what can I say? Um, check this movie out. It doesn't have a really a high rating on IMDb, but you know, it's a classic from the '50s. If you like sci-fi, sci-fi classic creature feature type movies, you will love this movie. It's a lot of fun. So, yeah, till we meet again, catch me on the NFW podcast. And peace out, my friends. All right, guys, our final review is coming up next, guys, of this show. This very long, well, not so long show, but um, I, I believe I saved one of the best ones for last because these guys love talking about cinema. You can hear them both on Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space together, but they do many other things themselves. That's another the Kill the Cast banner, by the way, on Legion Podcast. Um, Mr. Venom, Jerry Cortez, and uh, the, the ginger uh, wonderkind himself, wunderkind, uh, Jerry Herring, uh, ha- have brought us a review for a film called Day of the Beast. And uh, there is no English language trailer, so I will not torture you guys with a bunch of music and some random stuff said in Spanish that you may or may not understand. But uh, this is going to close out the show. Now, tomorrow, you guys should have a review from me uh, sometime midday uh, called, from a film called The Blood Beast Terror from 1968. Uh, this stars Peter Cushing uh, in one of his many, many roles of the day. And um, it sounds very interesting, and I can't wait to watch it. Something about a giant death head moth and, uh, and a beautiful woman, you know, metamorphosizing and... It just sounds really strange, and if you want to watch it with us, you can watch it on Tubi. Oh my god, it sounds awesome, and the poster looks awesome, but will the film be awesome? I don't know, man. But without further ado, and with much fanfare, enjoy this shit, guys. It's going to be great. I've listened to it already. Uh, This is Jerry and Venom doing The Day of the Beast, or some other title in Spanish I can't pronounce. Anyway, 
Take it away, guys. Greetings and salutations, lovers of all things beastly. This is Mr. Venom coming at you from No More Room in Hell. Fresh cuts in the mic of madness and creature feature, uh, creature comforts, excuse me, just to name a few. I am joined today by the esteemed host of Kill the Cast and Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Mr. Jerry Herring. How you doing, Jerry? I'm doing great. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing damn good. Busy, busy, busy podcasting. This month has been insane. I think I spread myself a little thin, but I'm knocking out like a couple of podcasts a day, and I got that pace going for at least another week. So, folks, if you're listening to this, obviously you know we are reviewing a film for Gary Hill's Cinema Beef podcast for the 31 Days of Howling Beasts um, series that he's doing, and we are looking at... 1995's The Day of the Beast, also known in its native Spain as El Día de la Bestia. Um, this is, uh, like I said, this film is a little bit newer. It's actually a 1995 film with a release in 1998 in the USA. So for that reason, being that it's one of the newer films on the series, I think we're going to co- come in with a spoiler-free review by that is written and directed by De la Iglesia. Oh, I love speaking Spanish. Can you tell um, you sound good doing it. I love it, my friend. Um, so yeah, no one really of uh, big names. Um, like I said, this is shot in Madrid, Spain, so you know you're not getting a lot of like heavy hitters in the genre. But uh, I'm gonna go ahead and let my esteemed partner in crime go first to give you his thoughts on the film, and then I'll go ahead and jump in. So, Jer, what did you think of the Day of the Beast? So, Day of the Beast follows, you know. Oh, it's another Antichrist movie. (laughs) But this one is so much different than all the other ones. Because, you know, the premise of the movie being that the priest has cracked the code in Revelation and he has to commit as many sins as possible to stop the birth of the Antichrist. And without watching the movie, that sounds pretty strange. How, How does that equal equal to each other you know i foot, i hit my foot in the shovel for your sins you got to figure it out watch the movie you'll find out but it takes such a fun and and weird turn as this like the beginning of the movie we just saw we just watch him commit all these random sins as he <laughs> walks around the town until he finally meets up with this metalhead dude and their wacky hijinks ensues. And uh, it's it's a movie that's such a, a breath of fresh air for that genre. But it's also so kind of unique and niche that I could see people not liking it. I'm not one of those people. It does have, I will say it has a little bit of a weird pacing. But I think that's just kind of part of the the uniqueness of this movie 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I can't speak enough. Just the setup of this story. Uh, before the cold open was even done, I was invested on my first watch of this. I was turned on to this film by Mr. Watson as he did a review of it um, back in the Horror Corridor days. He gave it a glowing review. And uh, Mr. Watson and I tend to kind of jive with all of our uh, movie opinions. So I went ahead and just blind bought the 4K disc. And let me tell you, folks, that's 35 bucks, very well spent, worth every penny. Yeah, I'm right there with Jerry. I absolutely love this film. This film is not labeled a horror comedy, but there is a lot of comedy in this, specifically between the relationships of our three main characters, um, Cura, which is just the Spanish word for priest. So everybody's just calling him priest or father throughout the film. Jose Maria, which is the black metal fan that Jerry uh, referred to earlier, working at a record store. And the priest, of course, goes into the store looking for bands that are close to Satan because he thinks that's a thing. Um, and just their conversation throughout most of the film is endlessly entertaining. I will admit that Jose Maria, as cool as he is, can get annoying later in the film there's one scene in particular where our three main characters are trying to traverse a building on the outside of the building um having already taken a large dose of acid you know uh, in this particular scene i wasn't real happy with jose maria i felt like he was you know kind of working against the end goal that the priest and our third character professor kavan who is a TV, uh, like a almost like an Unsolved Mysteries type TV host, um, you know, true crime, stuff like that. He ends up getting roped into this whole thing because the priest, for some reason, thinks that everything that Prof uh, Professor Kavan says on television is true or that he believes it 100 percent. So he thinks that he is going to be able to somehow utilize this guy's um, skills to actually get closer to the Satan. Um uh, because, as Jerry mentioned, because our priest figures out a code in Revelations, which kind of leads to potentially the birth of the Antichrist, um, he feels, the priest feels that if he commits as much sin as possible, it's going to bring him closer to Satan. Obviously, that plan kind of takes a side, you know, they kind of push it aside once they hook up with Professor Kavan, who then gives them a potentially another way of contacting Satan. But I'll leave that plot point alone, because like I said, this movie, I feel like this movie needs to be experienced by as many genre fans as possible. As Jerry mentioned, it's an absolute breath of fresh air. There's a lot of intentional and unintentional comedy that I felt worked for me. All three characters, whether you find them likable or not, are still very effective. I myself was not a big fan of Professor Kavan, but because I disliked him so much, I feel that the actor uh, Armando de Raza uh, actually did a great job portraying that kind of cynical, you know, um, kind of evangelical shyster character that, if you will, so... Yeah, this is an absolute fun ride. I agree with Jerry that there might be a little bit of uh, some pacing issues, especially in the second act. But once we kind of get past all that, uh, we get a pretty off the wall third act. And this is one of those movies that once you're done watching it, there's two very distinct paths your thinking can go. Um, and then the, I, I've heard it, even other people kind of come up with uh, a third and fourth interpretation of the ending. But it's definitely one of those things that's uh, subjective up to the viewer. And hey, if you're interested, this is an early cameo from Black Phillip. <laughs> we, get, we get a little bit of a ritual uh, in the second act of the film and we get a black goat appear. And instantly I'm like, hey, Black Phillip, what, 10, 15 years before the witch. So awesome. Black Phillip has had a long career. So, yeah, uh, again, I cannot say enough good things about this film. Um, it's not the most visceral out there. You're not getting a lot of gore. Um, but you are getting a very effective cold open that's definitely going to be a WTF type moment because it comes out of nowhere. And then, like I said, the relationships and, you know, everything else that's presented in the film is really, really enjoyable. I, I think that all genre fans will be able to get something out of it. You may not love the film as much as I do. Obviously, anyone who knows me, you know, my last name is Cortez. I am a Spaniard. My family is from Spain. So I tend to gravitate towards Spanish horror, which is part of the reason why I volunteered us to do this particular film, because it is a an, an amazing Spanish film from a great 
great director who uh, I'll, I'll actually be reviewing another one of this director's films, uh, 2013's Witchin' and Bitchin', on the next full episode of No More Room in Hell. That'll be our Halloween episode, but uh, that's enough for plugs. Uh, Mr. Herring, anything else you want to add to this? Yeah, I was wondering why you picked this movie. I thought it was because it was religious that it was and about <laughs> saying that you and I should be taking care of it. Because I was like, oh, well, he's doing beast movies. Well, me and me and Venom are perfect. We can do beast movies. And then Venom's like, I, so I chose the day of the beast. And I'm just like, oh, oh, we're doing this. Well, OK, then. Um, yeah, I do want to jump in and say that uh, this movie is not like a, a bunch of other horror movies because it almost like while it, the topic of it is horror at times it's a adventure through the city movie, a, a odd couple movie that becomes a, a trio and misunderstandings lead to best friends and, and that kind of thing. So when you go into this movie, understand that this um, kind of like jaws while the the it is a horror movie, it is also a adventure movie. It's a uh, you know odd couple movie. It's it's pretty much the Antichrist version of Jaws. I know it sounds weird, but like Venom, do you get what I'm saying? Like, I having seen it, one hundred percent understand what you're saying. Yeah, I I totally understand. Um, a lot of people aren't going to look at this as a true, quote unquote, true horror film. But I, I think that the themes discussed and obviously, you know, the, the actual um, task that our priest is going on solidly put, puts it in the horror genre. But there are other checkboxes that are also ticked off. There's comedy, there's drama, there's adventure, there's action. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of genres that are touched upon on this film, which is also one of the reasons I wanted to bring it, bring it to the table. It's not just a satanic movie. There's so much more to it that this is why I wanted to get as many ears on this one as possible because this movie should be experienced and if you're a genre fan and especially if you're a fan of religious horror, Day of the Beast is definitely one that you could uh, you could do a lot worse than watch this. Now, admittedly this is not a Halloween film but then again, this is uh, the 31 Days of Howling Beasts series, so since Beast is in the title, I went ahead and picked it. This is technically a Christmas horror film. The entire film takes place on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. So if you're looking for something to watch in December that you've never seen before, I could not recommend this one more. What do you think, Jer? 100%. And it's not in your face with the Christmas stuff. It's just kind of like noted a few times through the movie, which is great because if you're talking about the birth of the Antichrist, like, why would you not be born on Christmas? That's like perfect. <laughs> yep. But yeah, I think this movie is is so unique that... You just go in and watch it and see how you feel afterwards. I will say I watch the dub of it, and um, sometimes the dub is a little lacking. But since I've grown up on Godzilla movies, that doesn't bother me. For some of you, it may bother you. Not that big of a deal for me. You will also go through this movie liking characters and it may get to a point where you don't like them or there's characters you don't like and then you'll get to a point where you like them it's just it's just such a fun movie and the early intro with the priest walking around and like committing sins like some of them are just <laughs> stupid he steals tiki tack yeah <laughs> yeah he like just steals someone's like fucking luggage but then there's another point where like He's walking down the street and there's like a car. Right? This is I mean, this isn't really a spoiler, but he's walk, walking down the street and they're like, oh, pre priest, we need you. This guy's going to die. And he goes up and he takes the dude's wallet and then tells the dude, I hope you burn in hell. And then like puts this like a Baphomet like card tarot card in the dude's wallet before throwing it back on the ground. <laughs> like it's just like he's not doing like any like great sins it's all these like really small sins and you just sit there going is he gonna build up to like bigger sins like the whole movie you kind of never know which way it's gonna go and it's always very good at surprising you as to which way it's gonna go 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that that's part of the entertainment of the first act, watching our priest do these little minor sins. He takes like the change out of the change cup from a homeless guy who's begging on the street. He keys a series of cars in, in a parking lot as he's leaving a location. I mean, it's these little tiny sins. But what's funny is that it's kind of accurate because, you know, priests think – a uh, Catholic priest specifically do think that the tiniest little sin will send you to hell. So it was kind of funny, very funny, actually, watching this priest basically just do a series of minor sins that, you know, no God would ever send someone to hell for keying someone's car. That seems a little excessive. But uh, like I said, it, it fits within his frame of thinking, if you will. So, yeah, folks, that is The Day of the Beast, 1995, also known as El Dia de la Bestia. Written and directed by Alex de la Iglesia. So uh, once again, Jerry and I both think that uh, you should check this one out ASAP. But if you're already packed for October, it's a solid uh, Christmas time horror film as well. So check it out in December if you don't get a chance this month. On behalf of Jerry and myself, I definitely want to thank Mr. Gary Hill for giving us, uh, giving us this opportunity to jump into the 31 Days of Howling Beast series. This was an absolute treat for us. Uh, once again, Mr. Venom, you can hear me on No More Room in Hell, Fresh Cuts, Creature Comforts, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, In the Mic of Madness, and at least a dozen other podcasts that slip my mind right now. Uh, Jer, anything you want to plug for us? Yeah, you can hear me on Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, and In Your Parents' Bedroom. Woo! That's what my mom was yelling about. Wow. Good times. <laughs> so once again, thank you folks very much. Thank you, Gary, for the opportunity. And from Mr. Herring and myself, everyone, please have a happy and safe Halloween. Oh.